Pastor Sue Ulrich at Locust Grove United Church of Christ here in York, Pennsylvania. So happy that you could be with us today on this Palm Passion Sunday. So I invite you to get your bulletin and join me as we prepare to worship our Lord. Our call to worship today comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Tell him, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. join in our opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Oh 
that the children couldn't wait to see. We stood on the sidewalk enjoying all the floats. The kids had fun retrieving the candy the participants threw. We were having a great time. Then finally the moment came. The guest of honor appeared. It was the one, the only, Barney the Purple Dinosaur. Only problem was, he wasn't purple. So instead of his regular bright purple color, he was kind of reddish. I remember being very disappointed. I remember thinking, oh no, the kids have been waiting so long to see him. They're going to be so disappointed. And I remember thinking, couldn't they at least have tried to get a purple dinosaur? Couldn't they have spent a little more money to get a perfect costume? But apparently, I was the only one who was bothered by it. The kids were thrilled. It was Barney the purple kind of dinosaur. And they loved it. I wonder if on that first Palm Sunday, when that parade began, that procession, if some people weren't a little disappointed. I wonder if they might have expected a little more pomp and circumstance. After all, when kings came into Jerusalem, 
At other times, they rode in on a war horse and had their weapons brandished. And there was lots of pomp and circumstance. The one coming on the parade route would have dressed in uniform, and it was impressive. This parade on Palm Sunday consisted of a borrowed donkey with cloaks thrown over his back for the one riding it. It seemed more like a makeshift parade rather than anything fit for a king. And Mark, being the gospel author who spared his words, his account of this parade wasn't too impressive. We see that people spread their cloaks on the ground and branches they had cut in the fields. There were people walking ahead and following in this parade, and they were shouting. They shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the people that day had one definition of king and Messiah, and Jesus had another. The people thought Jesus was their Messiah to save them from Roman rule and oppression. As they shouted Hosanna, they were saying, save us. They wanted salvation. But it wasn't the kind Jesus was offering. Shouldn't the donkey and the itinerant preacher riding it have given it away? Much like Barney the dinosaur not being the right purple color, didn't anything seem a little bit off, a little unusual? Didn't it occur to them that this Messiah was not what they were expecting? If it hadn't that day, we know it didn't take long before it did. How quickly Hosanna's changed to crucify him. Jesus never gave them a false idea of who he was. The people just didn't listen. I guess they saw or heard what they wanted to see and hear. Much like our kids with Barney, any shade of purple we do, any old Messiah we do. Only Jesus was much more than they ever imagined. Even though the parade was lacking pomp and circumstance, even though he came to town on a borrowed donkey, even if their expectations were not met. For whether they knew it or not, this Messiah was the Messiah, the one who came to change everything and to offer us so much more than we could ever imagine. There are probably times we wish Jesus was a different kind of Messiah too, one who would make our problems go away. One who would make everything easy and right. One who would make life a little less stressful, a little more smooth sailing. But if we think and feel that way, we are as short-sighted as the people in Jerusalem that day. For Jesus came to offer salvation and freedom that goes beyond this life. He promised to walk with us in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the pain. He promised to give us peace and to never leave us. He came to offer a salvation that came with a great cost. He came to give what only a true Messiah could give, his very life. You are welcome now to join us in our scripture reading, which will be on the screen by reading the parts that are printed in bold. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him. Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. 
Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace that is called the Praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. O sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded, with thorns your only crown. How pale you are with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does your visage languish, which once was bright as morn? What you, dear Saviour, suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but yours the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Saviour, for I deserve your place. Look on me with your favor, O oh, grant to me your grace. What language shall I borrow to thank you, dearest friend, for this your dying sorrow, your pity without end? May I be yours forever, and though my days be few, O oh, Saviour, let me never outlive my love for you. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross 
that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Surely this man was the Son of God. Whenever I watch a movie about the life of Christ, and I have watched quite a few, I have always loved when this statement has been included in the story. Sometimes they leave it out, and it just feels lacking to me. For of all the things we witness in the accounts of the crucifixion, this statement is certainly one that is not expected, and certainly not from a Roman soldier. But when you and I think of the Roman soldiers associated with Jesus' death, we wince as we think of their cruelty and meanness. We think of how they mocked him by putting a purple robe on his sore, lash torn back, that they wove a crown of thorns and jammed it into his head, that they began to make fun of him by hailing him as king of the Jews as they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. When I see these things as I watch them in a movie, I get angry and I weep and feel for him. And I realize how much I dislike those Roman soldiers who never understand who this man truly was. I guess when they looked at Jesus, they saw a pathetic man who claimed to be a king, claimed to be the Jewish Messiah, who ended up on a cross. These soldiers, of course, would have participated in so many crucifixions, so many, and this was just one more for them. It's difficult to imagine they enjoyed doing this, Yet you wonder if a callousness began to fill them after a while when we see how they treated Jesus. If instead of seeing a person, they just saw another criminal, another person they could mock or ridicule. Yet the most striking thing of all when we read in the Bible or see these accounts in a movie is the response of Jesus. For he says nothing in his defense, he just takes it. 
And in all the other Gospels, it is recorded that he even forgave those who did this to him and even welcomed the one thief on the cross into paradise with him. Perhaps that is why the Roman soldier said those words that day. Perhaps when he looked at Jesus, he saw no hatred, no anger, no bitterness, only love. That he knew this was no ordinary man. I like what I read in one commentary as I was preparing for my sermon this week. It said, Although the centurion represents the enemy who is forced to acknowledge the superiority of the oppressed, his confession supplies the real title that should be written on the cross, the Son of God. The fact that the centurion's confession stands at the end of Mark suggests that the whole story of Jesus must be heard. The crucifixion must be seen before one knows what it means to confess. This is the Son of God. So as we have witnessed this makeshift parade into Jerusalem today, as we have looked at the cross and reflected on his life and love, what do we say about this man, this Messiah, Jesus? Do we recognize that he is the Messiah, the Savior, who came to change the world forever on that dark day when he died upon that cross? Do we recognize what that Roman centurion said? And do we let it change our lives, that Jesus is the Son of God? Or will we let another holy week go by and not let it make any difference in our lives? I invite you and me to take some time this week to spread, spend some time looking at who Jesus really is as we look closely at the pages of the Bible to see what he said and how he treated others, to look at that last week of his life and then to pause at the foot of the cross and realize for ourselves who this Messiah the Savior really is. Barney may have been the wrong color that day in the parade, but the kids still loved him. Jesus might not have looked or acted like the Messiah the people were expecting in the parade that first Palm Sunday, yet he was and is the Son of God. God is always working and moving in our lives in ways we never expect. Even through a donkey riding Messiah who gave his life for you and me. I pray we will all let him change us and work in us this very special week. Amen. As we come to our prayer concerns and joys, I see we have a birthday. London Burton, who is Glenn Meyer's granddaughter. So let's sing Happy Birthday together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear London. Happy birthday to you. And we have a joy. And you see in your bulletin it says, Congratulations to Nancy and Jerry Hildebrand on the birth of their great grandson, Asher Nelson Hildebrand, born Sunday, March 14th, to Dustin and Samantha Hildebrand. The proud grandparents are Michael and Stacy Hildebrand. So let me light a few candles. That's exciting. Congratulations. Um, I got a text this week from Barb Fry. She wanted us to pray, and I'm hoping I'm going to say the little girl's name right. Aaliyah. I'm not sure I'm saying this, but it's A-L-A-A-L-I-Y-A-H. She's 14 years old and has been diagnosed with 4B Hodgkins. So we want to certainly keep her in our prayers. 
pray for Bill and Bart too as well. And I think we definitely need to keep in prayer the people affected by the tornadoes in the south. Any of us who saw that newspaper or the news, the devastation was great. Let's pray for those folks. And pray for all of the, the victims of the recent shootings. Today there was another one. And we just want to continue to pray. To pray for our families and to pray that violence will end. And to pray for all those who have COVID and those who are getting vaccines. And pray that soon we will have relief inside and uh, turn around the right corner. So let us go before our Lord in prayer. Gracious God, it is not always easy to look at these stories in scripture. We like the parade. We like the idea of shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in our minds, we know what's coming. We know those Hosannas barely linger in the air when things change. And it's not easy to look at those scriptures, to read what happened to you, Lord. But help us to do that this week to take the time every day to read a portion, to journal about it, to pray about it, to truly let Holy Week affect us so that we can thank you and praise you and shout Hosanna and know why in our hearts deeper than we ever did before. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And you are our Savior. And we thank you for all you have done and for all you will do in our lives. And we thank you that we can, as a body of Christ here, through this wonderful technology, be able to connect and remember and share together all you have done and all you will do in our lives. Will do in our lives. We bring before you our joy today of London's birthday, and we ask the Lord to bless her with a wonderful day. And we congratulate Nancy and Jerry on their great-grandson, Asher, and Dustin and Samantha and Michael and Stacy. We just pray you bless little Asher, Lord, and we thank you for that wonderful gift. We lift up all of those affected by the tornadoes in the south, and we pray you give them comfort and strength, Lord, and the help they need. And we pray for the victims of the recent shootings and for violence to end, Lord, for this not to happen anymore. We lift up Bill and, and Barb's relative, Ilea, who is dealing a little 14-year-old girl diagnosed with Hodgkin's. And we ask, Lord, that the treatment she'll be getting soon will make a difference, Lord, and that you will bring her to health and wholeness. We lift up her family, and we lift up Bill and Barb as well. And we thank you, Lord, for all the people getting vaccinated. We pray you would work through that, Lord, that we're turning a corner soon and be with those who are still struggling with COVID. We look forward to the day we no longer hear the name. Thank you for bringing us to worship this day. We love you and we thank you that we can do this in this miraculous, wonderful way until we can meet in person. So bless each one who has watched this service today that we will draw closer to you and to one another as we join together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And thank you for continuing to bring in your offering and mail it in that we can continue to worship and serve our Lord together. So let's join in our offertory prayer. If we had a donkey to lend to Jesus, we would do so. If we could ease Christ's way to Calvary or prevent its cruelty, we would act. But these are not ours to give. So we offer what we have, the tithes and offerings we have given for your blessing, and all the riches we retain for ourselves. Use everything we are and have to advance Christ's reign among us. Amen. And now let's join in our closing hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? for sale. All the proceeds go to the Leg Up Farm and to Sparrow Place. So if you need a spring wreath, come on over there and help the cause. And let us join now in our benediction printed in our bulletin. Go now with faithful stamina into your courtyards to answer whether you know him or not. Go knowing that he said, he who said follow me will stand with you. Go knowing that when you falter, he will hold you up. Go knowing that when you fail, he will forgive you. Go knowing that when you say, I know this Jesus, you will dance with the angels on Easter morning. May, May you, you know, know the peace of faithfulness, the joy of community, and the love of grace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
God bless you and thank you for being in our service today.